Hello, everyone. Uh, this is According to John podcast. And today I have with me Father uh, Lawrence Farley for uh, our second discussion. Uh, welcome, Father. God bless you. It's good to be here with you again. And uh, we will speak about the priesthood. But uh, before we start to do that, maybe we can begin with uh, prayer. Uh, sure. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, have mercy upon us, grant to us your Holy Spirit, Master, and grant that in our conversation today we might glorify your most holy name for the edification of your people. Grant this, Father, through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the old, holy, good, and light fitting spirit, now and ever unto, unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Yes, so the topic of um, priesthood, it's, uh, it's a big topic, of course, and you can, uh, you can uh, discuss it from different angles. But today I'm, I want to discuss it from the point of view of the one who seeks the priesthood and the one who um, thinks about, do I have a calling or not? So... Maybe we can start with you as an introduction. What led you to the, what led you to the priesthood? Um, I think what led me to being uh, clergy it, it originally in the, uh, the plan was in the United Church of Canada, uh, and then in uh, then in the Anglican Church, and then at the Church of Orthodox, of course, um, was an enthusiasm and a desire to share the reality of Jesus that I had found. I was raised, if you if you'll forgive it. A moment or two of a boring autobiography, uh, was raised in the 1950s in North America, which is to say in a suburban, white bread, respectable place. So even if you didn't have a living and vibrant Christian faith in the home, you sent your kid to Sunday school because that's what you did. You probably go to church maybe Christmas and Easter or whatever. But I was not raised, I was raised by wonderful parents, but they were practicing Christians at the time when I was very young. Just like I said, kind of a, a Christmas and Easter people. Um, and so not being raised in, in, in a place with any real faith, I didn't have any faith growing up. But eventually, when I started to try to sort out what the world was like, and what human existence was like, and why are we here, and all this sort of thing, went back to the United Church of Canada, looking for answers, which is where I used to go to Sunday school. And there I had the good providential fortune to meet some young people my own age, which is to say about 17 or 18 or so, uh, who were involved in the Jesus People Movement. The Jesus, the Jesus People Movement was a very brief uh, phenomenon, uh, mostly in North America, but in other places as well, of um, uh, young people, long hair and jeans, uh, finding Christ, getting off drugs, keeping their long hair and jeans, but being very enthusiastic about, uh, um, about sharing the gospel. And so I was caught up in the midst of this, um, and found Christ through this uh, very kind of evangelical, charismatic Jesus people thing. Um, eventually left, uh, very quickly left the United Church of Canada for uh, the more venerable and uh, older uh, Anglican Church of Canada, um, and then and was ordained for, uh, for the Anglican Church and served in a, a couple of parishes in Northern Saskatchewan, the Canadian Prairie for six years or so, before finding my way home to Orthodoxy. But the original desire was to share the reality of Jesus that I had that I had found. I wanted to kind of take the world by the lapel, shake them and said, Jesus is alive. Jesus loves you. Jesus can change your life. So for me, it was a desire to preach the gospel. And I managed to survive my trek through the United Church of Canada and Anglicanism and finally coming home to Orthodoxy. The constant in there was a desire to preach the gospel to, and to reach the world with the reality of Jesus that I, that I had found myself. Yes, so many young men or even older men maybe are thinking about the priesthood. and But it's not always easy to know if this is some egoistic trip <laughs> you're having or an impulse or is it something you actually want or the perhaps also the bigger question does god want it so one question is how do we discern if we have a real calling um i would suggest that there are two um two major components in this discernment process of trying to figure out whether or not you should be a priest 
First is the subjective personal one. If you could conceivably see yourself being happy doing anything else, do that instead. You know, if you're, if you say, well, it's a, I could be a clergyman or I could be a journalist or I could be a teacher or open my own business, you know, uh, okay, then don't be a priest, go do one of those other things. There was a wonderful, um, one of my uh, wonderful mentors in the Anglican church, the chap who married my wife and I, um, Father Bill Uton of, of Blessed Memory. And when people would come to him saying that they thought that they, they might want to be a priest, he would always try to talk them out of it. And he thought, if I could talk them out of it, then there was a sign that they should never be a priest, you know? And if I couldn't talk them out of it, there was a chance that maybe it might could conceivably work out. So I would say to them, if you, if you could conceivably imagine yourself doing something else, do that instead. You have to, if you're going to be a, a priest, you have to be able to be a priest because, because you say, I, I can't do anything else with, with my life. Uh, you have to say, in the words of St. Paul, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. You know, you have to have the sense of compulsion to do that. Um, that's the one component. The other component, the um, uh, uh, conf confirmation of it, as it were, is if the people who know you well and love you, if they say axios, if they say, yes, that's right, I think you got it right, you should be a priest. Because if they, it's very, as you point out, it's very easy for someone to want to be a clergy because um, you, the words of the Lord, you like wearing the long robes and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and things like that, you know, you, and it's, it's all about you. So I'm, and I'm a, little, a little bit suspicious of the appropriateness. If someone says, I want to be a priest, I thought, well, or, you know, is it the robe? Is it the, is it the title? Is it the, is, is it, is it the greetings? Whereas if someone says, if, if they phrase it, not in terms of saying, I want to be a priest, but I want to preach the gospel, or I want to stand at the altar and liturgize. I want to be able to do something for God. You know, if it's in short, if it's about doing something for God and, and not about not about them, you know, that that's more it's more likely because you can find the priesthood attracts some wonderful people and it tends to attract more than its fair share of wackos, people who are severely dysfunctional and are, are drawn to the thing too, and sometimes. They end up getting ordained and into parishes and it's a mess and and then it's a problem because after you're ordained and you're in a parish if you turned out that you the guy is a wacko or at least not suited to the priesthood i mean what are you gonna do you can't shoot him so so what does the bishop do with them well they usually let them stay in there and mess up the place or if there's too many complaints uh and too much mess he'll just move them but i mean so it's a problem so um, like I said, there's, if, whereas if you say, I, I, I feel like I couldn't do anything else and other people that know you that, and, and, and love you and have some sense of accountability, they love you enough to speak the truth, to say, you shouldn't be a priest, you know, I love you, but don't do that, you know, then um, if, if those type of people can say axios to you, then there's a, at least a possibility that, that God is calling you to, to the priesthood, but you kind of need the axios, you know, in the, in the early church, before um, um, a bishop was or a bishop was consecrated, a bishop was ordained. He was chosen by his flock locally. This is a long time ago, uh, and the flocks that would say axios, and that it was understood that this popular axios by the flock was as important as the ordination rite itself. This was a sign from God that that God was calling this person to be the leader for this particular flock. If there was no axios, then then this is a then this is a problem. He'd be validly ordained, but you, you you kind of you kind of needed both. So I think in this we we don't do that anymore. Now when we say axios, it's all over. You know they, they never ask for the uh, whether it's a bishop or a priest. They generally never ask for the axios of the people. Um, the you know you are ordained the person and you say axios. It doesn't mean worthy. Now it, it just simply means muzzle tough. You know I mean con congratulations. Whether it's a mistake or not, anyway it's done. So so. The time, the important axios is the one that happens before the ordination, and that if it's not going to be supplied liturgically by the, the bishop coming in to saying, do you, what do you think, axios, you know, or not? Uh, if, there's, if he says, what do you think, axios, and is there, if there's a stunning silence, then maybe this is not a, a, a you should sh shut her down and go have coffee. But, uh, but if there, uh, even if you don't get the liturgical axios uh, asked for by the bishop at the time, at least if there's, if the people who know you and love you can give you a more informal non-liturgical axios to say, no, I think, I think you, I think 
you can you can do this safely and wonderfully, then I think that's that's a sign that that perhaps God has God has called you. But you need this ex objective exterior authentication. Your your overwhelming desire might indicate that God's called you to do it, or might indicate that you're simply pathological and egotistic. You never know. Yeah. So how how do we how do a person know or that God is calling him? Uh, you have uh, touched about it, but um, is it something more there, so specific? Um, I think that um, I think that it's um, in in talking about it as a calling, it makes it seem awfully kind of mystical, you know. And I think it's it, it's more likely to say, I have a drive to do something for God. I want to serve, and I have want to serve in 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 this way. Those that know me and love me say I would I would do a good job in, in it. And so, you know, I'll do that. There was one in a, in a parish, there was one uh, person who uh, was a call to um, the diaconate. I won't embarrass him because he might actually find this thing and so he would, he would be. Um, but uh, he said, no, you need, we needed a deacon in the parish because we didn't have one. And he said, you need a deacon. And so I will, I'll, I'll help since nobody else is stepping up to do it, I'll do it. And he was absolutely wonderful. He was hardworking, sensitive, humble, uh, golden deacon. He was wonderful. Um, but he didn't, if, if you had asked him, do I, do I have a sense of calling? He says, well, no, not particularly, but it needed to get done. And Father Lawrence needs a deacon and I'll, I love him. I'll help him out. So, and I think that it, it's maybe making it too mystical to you know, say, do you have, have a calling? You know what I mean? That you, you, you went out on a starry night and looked up into the stars and God said, be a deacon or be a priest. You know, that, that's um it, it it's it it's rarely it's rarely like that i think yeah maybe his calling this deacon was that he was at this place at this time um i, I know also priests that priests that have they have simply just been in the church their whole life yeah and that doesn't mean that they're uh, entering into the priesthood is something ingenuous because it's it's some something of a natural step for them yeah um so but uh so could you could you also say that if you know if the bishop comes to you and say i want you to be a priest i think if that happens i, I consider that also to be a calling from god you know if you know, you can also always uh, say, oh, but the bishop is this and that. But in general, I think that's uh, the case or. Um, uh, maybe. See, the, the thing about the thing about our bishops is that in the early days, they used to be the local pastor, as you know, be the bishop of a particular city. So if you were the bishop of, uh, um, say, Toronto in Canada, you would all of the Orthodox churches in Toronto, which would be sizable. Um, would be under you, all of the baptisms that took place in Toronto, you would authorize and you would be, you, you would do the baptisms and maybe in the farmland around Toronto. Um, so, but you were the local pastor and you kind of knew the people and they knew you. Um, now the bishops are, have a uh, responsibility beyond one city or one town or one village. In the case of the Archdiocese of Canada, it's the, it, it's, it's Bishop of Ottawa and Canada. So, I mean, Canada, for heaven's sake, it, it, it borders three oceans. So he's, you can't be the pastor for an entire country. Um, the, if, you, if somebody in the parish is having marriage problems, or if your kid gets sick, uh, or if you have uh, difficulties, then you need to be praying for it. You don't call the bishop, you know? And so the, the bishop's job is therefore primarily administrative and not pastoral, because that's the hand that, that he's been dealt with, as it were. So his job is, I would argue that uh, his uh, primary job, obviously he liturgizes as well, but his, his primary task and job in the archdiocese is to find um, uh, pastors for all the various parishes in there. So if, 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 if there's a new mission, he's got to find a priest for it. If the, if the priest in the church dies or retires, he's got to find somebody to do that. Um, so he has all sorts of incentive to say, I have to plug this hole with a priest. So if you want to be a priest, you're it. I mean, he's, he's, he's un, he, he is unlikely to say, no, you're a wonderful person, but you're not, 
you're not good to be a priest. You know, how do you say it? As long as he's uh, got a pulse and he's not, you know, a long criminal record, probably the bishop's not going to, you know, the bishop's going to say, you'll be fine, you know? Um, the, the, the task of discernment has to be left to others because he's under all sorts of pressure to fill that hole. If he doesn't get that guy, then, then, then what's he going to do? They're, they're not lining up around the block to fill this parish vacancy. So because of that, I um, admittedly, if the bishop says, no, I don't think you should be a priest, then you know there's something wrong with this guy. But, but generally speaking, um, the bishops ha have, are under so much pressure to fill the parishes that, that an axios from a bishop, it's not nothing, but it's, it's not as significant as the axios from the people that know you in the parish or possibly from your, from your, from your own parish priest. Yeah, I mean, also, even the canons speak about that, that the bishop can make the wrong, you know, decision. If you, if you hide your life and, you know, fool the bishop, it's, it's not, you can't say, oh, the bishop said, okay, but it's your responsibility to, to be truthful. Um, here comes also in the role of the spiritual father. And um, in my thinking, I, a way to be more sure is to also, because you can always fool yourself. And one way to be more sure is to let God also speak through the spiritual father. If you, let's say you have confessed to the same spiritual father for many years, he knows you in and out. And he says to you one day, I recommend the priesthood for you. I think that's also is. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's right. That's the, that takes the, that's that's the modern the modern form of the axios someone that actually knows you well um mm -hmm. so that like i said um if your local parish priest or your spiritual father your confessor that knows you well if is he if he is able to suggest it or authenticate a, a drive that you that you have then it's more it's more likely to be able to work out but in the end so how uh, can we speak a little more about the calling from within um, as you said, it's not, um, you know, it, it can be, I mean, it happened to Moses, but for the most people, it's not a, a clear voice. Right. Um, maybe we can talk about how you respond to that because some prophets say, no, I'm not worthy. Go away, you know, take another one. Right. And, uh, God is like striking them down because who are they to, you know, say no to God and, and others, you know, here I am, take me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, what should be our, uh, how should we act if we think there is I, a calling? I would think if, if uh, there's, there's probably um, two ways to come at it. One is if the person has a desire, then the desire needs to be authenticated with it, with that external axios. Um, if, if in the case the person thinks, I'm not sure that I want to be a priest, but someone, enough, enough people come up to me and said, you should be a priest. You should, one should at least consider the possibility. Um, but I think that there's enough challenges in, the, uh, in running a parish. There's enough spiritual combat going on. There's enough pressure on the priest that if, you, if there's not an, an inner sense of, I need to do this. I can do this. I want to do this. I have to do this. If you don't have that, I don't think that they are likely to fare as well when the pressure comes. They're more likely to collapse. And and the other thing that we're probably going to talk about sometime is is the role of the priest's wife in in all of this. Um, if he doesn't have a clear sense of calling, um, you're really dragging her into a very difficult situation because she's gonna she will feel that pressure as well, maybe even a little more so than the, than the priest. Um, what will get you through the difficult times and the difficult parishes um, is if you have a sense of calling that Christ is calling me to be a shepherd to his people. If you have that, then you can maybe survive toxic parishes um, because there are toxic parishes out there. Yeah, what, in, oh, what's what's a toxic? I, I realize this is news to you, of course, but, but there are toxic parishes that, um, that should be closed. I'm a father of... Uh, um, uh, from Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory said, yes, yeah, some of them are like synagogues of Satan. 
you know, they're, they're full of toxic people, they're full of ill people. If you join that parish and you're healthy, it will make you ill. You need to, you need to not go, you don't need, need to not go to that parish. And so, um, so, and if you can, if you can get the bishop to get you out of there, that's good, but he might not get you out of there or might not get you out of there very quickly because of course, if he, get, if he moves you out, he's got to put some other poor victim in there and they don't, and um, they might not be lining up to get into that place either. So there will be all sorts of suffering that, that you have to endure in some, in some of those, some of those places. If you, I think that if you don't have a, a, a sense of interior call to the priesthood, then you're, it will crush you. And it will also do bad things to your marriage and bad things to your children. So, and like I said, bishops are, are loath to close parishes, especially they keep sending in their apportionment money. Uh, they're, they're more likely to say, you know, um, the person who says, Bishop, this place is toxic. I think it should be closed. He's more like, you're more, you're more likely to get scolded or some, uh, forgive me, some pious claptrap about self-sacrifice and love and patience and stuff like that. When, when in fact you, you, you should simply close the place. Um, but like I said, that, that doesn't happen very often or maybe yeah. ever. So uh, what will get them through them is, is a sense of saying, uh, Christ has called me to this job. And so I will, uh, I will do this to my very last death. I will die a priest, you know, maybe, maybe on a cross, but at any rate, I will die uh, a priest. You, one needs that sense of inner calling, I think. What could these, uh, some of these challenges the priest uh, have um, that you mentioned here be? Can you give some example? It doesn't need to be from a real example, but no. uh, just so the audience know what we're talking about. That's right. Um, yes, I, I, obviously, we don't use uh, ex personal examples from my own experience, but um, I, I've been doing this for a while. I don't know, I, I forget. I was ordained for the Anglicans in 1979 and for the Orthodox in in 80 in 86 so i've been doing this for a while um and so i've seen lots of uh, wonderful places and lots of terrible places and and you hear through the grapevine of what's going on and so part of the part of the challenge is that the 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 priest has to have a sense of inner discernment to know when to confront someone when to just let it slide um uh when to respond to criticism that you're going to get when to just not respond. Um, there was a song by, um, an older song by, um, um, uh, called The Gambler. Uh, and one of the, the lines in the song, I'm, I'm dating myself, I know, it says you gotta, it's, it's talking about gambling and uh, playing cards, but it said, you gotta know when to hold up, you gotta know when to fold up, you gotta know when to walk away and know when to run. And that's not just in life and in gambling, it's a, a metaphor for, um, running a parish as well. You need to know when to, when to hold up and when to take, when to stay the course. And, when, and you need to know to say, this is not worth it. You know, you gotta, you gotta know when to walk away from a parish and you need to know when to run, run away from a parish. Um, um, and so part of it is to say you, not every, I say, you don't have to die on every hill. You know, you have to have a sense of inner discernment um, and, and it's challenging and you're gonna be, because priests are fallible like anybody else. Sometimes you're going to make the wrong call and you're going to make some mistakes. Um, but the, the pressures that are on the clergy is that you will always be in the public eye. You will be living in a goldfish bowl. You will be, everyone's going to check you out. In the sense that everyone's going to rate you, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how was that sermon? On a scale of one to 10, how is that, you know, are you a good confessor? Are you, are you this, are you, are you that? So you get all sorts of criticism. Uh, your sermons are too short. Your sermons are too long. You know, very often the same sermon. You know, that sort of stuff. You know, that um, uh, uh, the priest is too tyrannical, or the priest is too easy. You know, again for the same parish, the same priest. So you gotta know, uh, be able to take criticism and still love people, but to know, to to have a sense of boundaries to say, okay, this criticism is the, that I have to deal with. That's not gonna. That's not gonna happen. So. Um, there's all of those challenges, and that's why the you, uh, the priest needs to have a sense of his own calling, have a sense of maturity. You know, you don't mind criticism. You don't mind. You, you can you can you can handle it, um, and you draw strength from the other clergy in the area. Draw strength from uh, your spouse if you're married. You know, you need to have a support group. 
people that you trust that you can go to and that they can speak truth to you to say, actually, father, you messed up, you know, you gotta, you, you are, or to say to them, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this with the parish council and they can say, for God's sakes, don't do that. You know, do, do something else. You have to have a support group that can speak truth to you, that can support you, that can, uh, you know, wipe the blood off you after a bad battle, that sort of stuff. You know, people that will love you and trust you and that, and that you love and trust. You kind of need to have the support group if you're going to weather the challenges that come from being the head of a, a community of people that are the people of God, but they're, but they're, but like the priest, they're, they're fallen sinners as well. Yeah. I mean, there, there is also this danger of uh, flattery, I think it's called, you know, yes. uh, too much of that can also um, be bad. So I think St. John Chrysostom says, you know, beware of both. Uh, yeah. That... Usually when you, when, when you're, when I say to the new clergy, who's had a number of people um, from, from my parish of St. Hermans go on to seek holy orders, deacons or priests. And so when you, I say, when you, when you, when you first come to the parish, the people that are at everything and uh, flatter you and tell you what a wonderful priest you are, watch out. Don't, don't trust that. Um, the, the, it's the, it's the faithful quiet one that you can probably depend upon. But if the, if the, if the person trumpets their loyalty in a, in a, in a big way, you, you want to be a little bit careful with that. That, that's like my, that was one of my criteria i don't know if i want to call it criteria but when i needed to get a spiritual father and when i didn't have one i was i don't know if i did it consciously but i was sort of testing if yeah. the, this priest would say oh you're so good you're so that and i i, I don't yeah. i i'm sick i need help <laughs> you know yes. so i was looking yeah. for the spirit father that would just if I said like, oh, I, if I said something good, I have done, and the spiritual just looked at me, so <laughs> that you're the one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. It's 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 a spiritual father or a confessor. It is a little bit like the doctor. You know, you go to the doctor not so that he can say you're very healthy, you're so wonderful. No, no, you need the doctor to say, uh, tell me where it hurts, and I'll try to tell you what's wrong with you. You need the doctor <laughs> to tell you what's wrong with you, not to tell you what's what's not wrong with you. Your right yeah. arm is fine. Yeah, but it's my, but my knee hurts. Okay, you know, you know, you know. So you need them to focus in in a loving sort of way on what's wrong with you. I mean, that's the whole point of seeing a doctor or a confessor in many ways. Yeah, I, I have said this to my wife many times that it's a really strange uh, relationships relationship you have with your spiritual father because the only thing he knows about you or the only thing you're basically telling him is what's wrong with you <laughs> and he still okay. loves you and prays for you and that bond is uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. you, can, yeah, you can't replace it um maybe we can say something about the characteristics uh, of the priest and i'm thinking a good starting point is the scriptures and first timothy chapter three where saint paul uh, instructs uh, Timothy, what he should look for uh, for the priest, or also what the priest should, uh, you know, think about. Yeah, um, I think the, the Saint Paul's main concern in the, when in, in trying to find uh, leaders, what he's, he's mentioning there, is what what was it, what's important is their character and their sense of maturity. You know, so you can tell what kind of a how mature he is I and mean, what kind of a person he is by looking at his family you know uh, so he's saying look if, if his if his if his kids are out of control there's a you know this is a maybe um uh, he, he might just be unlucky in his children but nonetheless he he, he had a share in raising them so you know you gotta so you want to find somebody that has a sense of character and maturity that will be well spoken of outside the church you know you're not going to create a scandal especially in the first century when there's all sorts of um, pressures on the Christian church there. You're, you were under the microscope even more than they are today, possibly. Um, and I think that part the, um, the as, as well as a sense of boundaries, the, what, it, what it comes down to for the priesthood today is that the, the priest needs to be um, in, uh, have the same sort of love and self-sacrifice for the parishioners that you would have with your kids your adult kids. I mean, so 
um, the, the, the people at St. Herman's are mostly all kind of my kids. I mean, so we have a, that, that said, we have lots and lots of actual children. There were probably about 40% under the age of 12, so it's lots of kids. But um, uh, those children came from the adult, <laughs> their adult parents at St. Herman's. So they're all kind of my kids in this, and in the sense that you got to, you would do anything for your children. So in the same sense, you kind of, you would do anything for your parishioners as well. But there's still a sense of um, uh, that, that, uh, that boundary between child, child and parent, despite the fact that my children know that I love them and I would do anything for them and would, self, and would sacrifice myself for them. You know, you still don't call me Lawrence, you still call me dad. You know, there's still that, that's still like that the degree of separation there a little bit in kind of the, the normal parental boundaries. So, and in, and in the same way, although the, the, the people in the parish should know that the priest loves them and would sacrifice for them, you know, you, you still don't say, call me Bob. No, no, that would be Father Bob or something like that. You know, there, there's still a, um, um, so that there's priest uh, is different. And that means it's, it's difficult to find, for a priest to find friendship in the parish. You can't, you, you relate to your, to your parishioners, not as your friends, where, where there is a, an element of equality um, and where my friends can kind of read me the riot act. But you don't, you don't read your priest the riot act. If you have a problem, you, or if, he, if he messes up, you can tell him that, but it's not the same thing. You, you, would, you would confront him and call him to account rather differently than my friends would, uh, would uh, confront me and, call me and call me to account. There's still that element of honor and respect there um, uh, that doesn't exist among friends. Friends are radically equal and the, 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 uh, the priest at his pressures can't be radically equal anymore than I can be radically equal to my kids. I'm still dad. You still got to call me dad, you know? And so, um, uh, so because of that, it means it's difficult for the priest to have friends in the parish. You can't have friends in the parish. They're, you can be friends with the kids, but not like friends with your other friends, you know? So, um, so that, can make, that can mean that it's lonely because you still are, the, the, you're still expending yourself um, spending time, energy uh, on your on your people. Their sorrows are are your sorrows. Their sufferings are your sufferings. Their triumphs are your triumphs to 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 a certain degree. Uh, as as Saint Paul says, you know, you um, um, uh, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. So you do that with your parishioners, um, and so the the dynamic is that they 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 look to you in the same way as they would look to their father. Father isn't just a, a an honorific title. That's how the priest, you know, it's not just a job. Like uh, being a dad to my kids is not a job. It, it's who I am. And in the same way, being the priest, being a father in, in, in the community, that's not, that's not just a title. That's not just something that he does. It's not a function. It's who he is. He is the father to, to the people there. Um, so it's not just, it's not just a job. It means that you're not you know, if you have a parish, you're not saying, well, it's a tiny little parish, and I'll stay here until something better comes along. No, no, that, that, that they're your kids. You don't abandon your family. If the bishop says, I'm moving you, okay, aye, aye, captain, you've got to salute and get moved. But the, the, the parish isn't a stepping stone to a better parish. The parish is your family. You know, they're, they're, they're your kids, and all things being equal, you stay with them until you're dead. Yeah, maybe we could uh, um, halt a bit here and uh, talk about that because the topic of uh, the priest and having friends, I have been thinking about it for a long time and uh, you, you're sort of the first one now mentioning it and that's maybe because I'm, I have not read a lot or I don't know, but, but there is, what I have discovered is that there is a sort of joyful sorrow in that loneliness it's not like you know that this is a sacrifice but it's in christ so that brings this joy of the resurrection in in a sense but but that's that is a a step or a stumbling block maybe for many because it's it's also your previous friends perhaps when if you say i want to become a priest or i, I will or whatever um they will look at you differently from that point on yeah. uh, it's like you can't change that yeah 
they will treat you as a priest already almost. Uh, so, and there is this sense maybe people feel like I, I, I need also a friend, you know, I need, um, but so, yeah, maybe you can give some advice to that. Um, uh, it's de depending upon where you are geographically, priesthood can be awfully lonely in the sense that you, you, do need, you do need friends. You need someone that you can open up to, someone that you can complain to. Um, you know, and you, you complain about your parish, complain about your bishop, complain about the weather, complain about the government, whatever. Just, you know, someone that you can let down, let, let down your hair with and be yourself. Um, you know, pour the beer, we're gonna go watch hockey together, whatever, something like this. And so um, you need to have friends. And since they can't be friends in the parish, they have to be friends outside the parish. Very often they are other priests. Because um, obviously you wouldn't be sharing things like confession, but you, you know, you know, confidential details. But if you have a frustration with the bishop or the dean or the parish or the other, you know, whatever, you, you have to have a safe person to tell that to. Not, not, a, not a lot of people. Most people only have maybe two or three real friends, lots and lots of acquaintances and people that you're friendly with. But in terms of real friends, soulmates, confidants, probably not too many of them, but, but you need them. And so um, uh, the nice thing about today is that we can uh, do it by Zoom possibly or something like this or phone calls and things like this. But then the, in the early days of the archdiocese here, but they, there were not many clergy spread out across the whole country. And so some of them were, were, were very, very lonely because they, they, the nearest Orthodox priest was 300 miles away. Just probably uh, they're more <clears throat> densely packed in Greece, possibly, uh, <clears throat> and in Russia and Ukraine and whatever, but in Canada, not so much. Yeah. And so, um, so that can be um, um, a lonely thing, but you saw, but, so, but it's important for the, uh, for the clergy to find a friend someplace, whether it's, and it, it doesn't have to be enough, a fellow Orthodox, you know, have some dear, very dear friends who aren't Orthodox, um, um, but they're still my friends and we can still um, um, laugh and sing and howl at the moon and call each other to account and share and talk and things like that. You, you kind of need that or life can be very, very lonely in the, in the parish because you know, there's, there's certain things that you can share with with the prisoners, but there are these there are these boundaries, and certain things you can't. And it's it's very very difficult and dangerous to, for a, um, a clergy to say, "I have these friends in the parish," because when you say these people are my friends, you are thereby saying, "And these people are not my friends; they're just acquaintances." So you can't have you can't have favorites in the parish. And if you if you have you know friends in the parish, this couple, you know the. Um, the, the wife and I uh, go out to dinner with this other couple in the parish, you know, and we sort of socialize and see movies together. This is a problem because that'll be, they will, will be perceived correctly to be your favorites in the parish. And how do you, how do, how do you be a father to them? How do you call them? How do you rebuke them or correct them? Or, you know, it, it, it's hard to do. So, um, so like I said, that, that's why I say that the clergy, can't have those sort of friends as parishioners. You 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 got to look for your friendship outside. So what do you do if you know you you become a priest in the parish you have gone to your whole life? So the chances are your best friends are in that parish. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like you you know you come to a new parish and then you, right. you choose two or three persons to be your uh, special uh, friends. We've 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 had that situation. Uh, at, at St. Herman's when some of the people have gone on to be clergy. And of course you're, um, so there's, in those situations, it's um, usually, mind you, if you are if you become a priest, you go someplace else, you know? You, you you might be attached to the same parish, but the bishop's got all of those vacancies to fill. So he's, he's, he's unlikely to leave you as a second priest in the parish. He's more likely to say, I got this place that needs filling over there and that's where you're going. Um, but you can still, so, but because, um, it, you, you can still have your friends after ordination, you can still have your old friends in the parish because you're not in that parish. If someone says, well, you, you're, you're friends with these people more than those people, it's, it's not a, an issue, it's not a problem because you're not there. You're, you're probably living in another, another town anyway. Um, and, when you, and when you come back in the parish, um, 
for or 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 for example, our, a deacon. Um, a deacon's probably is going to stay in the same parish. So you knew this person when he wasn't a deacon, and, and then becomes a deacon. Um, there, it's most people cut the deacons more slack than they would the parish priest because the deacon doesn't hear the confession and the deacon doesn't have to be, you know, if you're messing up, it's probably the priest is going to tell you, not the deacon. So, um, but, and, but even so there's a, um, a convention of, of formality, like for example, um, my children, when, when, uh, um, my youngest daughter is the choir director of, of, of St. Herman's and quite wonderful she is. Um, so when, when we're together there and she needs to talk to me, she'll say, father, you know, and that sort of stuff. But we're in the car on the way home, which is dad. So there's the, there's the literary or social convention of treating me like the priest when the other parishioners are around. But when they're, but when they're not around, just wasn't your dad. Um, but when there's somebody else around, or the same as my beloved Marishka, she would say, you know, um, you know, if you need to talk to father, father's over there. Father, can you talk to this person? You know, but in the car, it's just honey, you know, that sort of stuff. So yeah, so, it's yeah. A, it's like you, when you're with your children, you say mom says this or yes, yes, yeah, yeah. something like yes. that. So that there's there's respect for the role. Um, so it's kind of a, a dual thing, you know, you you. Uh, you manifest a certain amount of outward formality um, when when there's when there's more informality there. It, it, it would be the same with the deacon and his, and his friends. You can talk about when the other prisoners are around, you can say, Father Deacon, you know? But when there's nobody around, you just say, you know, uh, Greg or Simeon or, or Zane, you know, that sort of stuff, whatever you call them by the name so there's nobody else around. In the liturgical assembly and again at, at coffee hour, Father Deacon, you know, that sort of stuff. So. Um, I think that's that's one way of trying to um, combine uh, the respect to the office and the formality that, that comes with that, with the fact that they're still they're still they're still your friends after divine liturgy. You're you're all going out for a beer together, that sort of thing. So, yeah. thank you. Uh, so maybe we can talk uh, about uh, the the married priest, you know, yeah. which is the most most common case. Um, I don't know how to put that question. Really, it's. Uh, I understand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, let, let me let me kind of jump in if you like. Yeah, thank um, you. Save me. <laughs> um, the, um, I'm not really quite sure what it's like to be a single adult because I was married just shortly after my 22nd birthday. So I'm, you know, um, um, and most of the clergy that I know are married. There's some really wonderful um, single, single, uh, single parish priests. So. Um, anything I'm about to say, this doesn't mean that you can't have wonderful single parish priests. This is not, this is, this is not, uh, it should not be construed as any kind of um, critique or negativity towards that. But, but generally speaking, the, um, the advantage that married clergy have is, um, is, is twofold. One is that, like you said, you, you need somebody to blow off steam to, um, and so the first thing, first thing is the wife. You know, you, you get in the car, close the doors, no prisoners around. And then you can, then you can, then you can let loose if you have to. You know, um, so you, you can share your frustrations and your joys, your fears and your aspirations with somebody safe. Um, if you're single, I have no idea who you do that. I, I guess you you have, you have to find a friend. The friends become even more important than that. Um, and the. Uh, the other thing or two is that being married kind of grounds you and roots you in the world so that if you're giving advice to parishioners uh, when they ask about um, a marriage counseling or about child rearing and stuff like that, you're, you're more likely to know what you're talking about if you're married and if you've, if you've raised, if you raise kids. So that if you uh, like, why, why, how do you say this nicely? Why one would ask a marriage celibate clergy advice for marriage counseling? I have no clue. You know, like with all with all due respect, you don't know what you're talking about. Can't get this out of a book. You got the the joys and challenges, uh, uh, glories and difficulties of marriage can only be you know you gotta you gotta you gotta be there. You have to experience it yourself. Same as raising kids. The, usually, people notice that the people who are most full of helpful <clears throat> advice about how to be happily married are single people. <clears throat> 
and the people that are most free with advice for child rearing are those that are childless. You know, there's nothing like, <clears throat> pardon me. So you gotta, so the, the advantage to being married with children is that you're, it, it grounds you in the world and gives you a perspective and, and the people in the parish kind of know that you, you know what you're talking about because they, you're, you're one of them. You, you know what it's like to be married. You know uh, what it's like to raise kids. Um, so, um, so yeah, so there was the, uh, I think that, that, that kind of roots you, roots you in the world and gives you a sense of perspective. The other thing is about, about being married is that there's somebody right on hand to whom you are accountable that can tell you when you're being an idiot. You know, I don't know how bishops survive because they're not married. And if they are being idiotic or uh, uh, in need of correction, who's going to do that? What, the wife? There's no wife. The, your, your clergy aren't going to do that or you got suspended or fired. So who's going to, and the, the, the parishioners that you come and visit for the, the wine and cheese when you make your thing in the parish, I mean, they're not going to correct you. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about wine and cheese, right? So it's not about... In Greece, it's the old, it's the old ladies, <laughs> yes, the let's, grandmothers. Let's hear, it. let's hear it for grannies, but but you know, um, usually in some of those settings, the parish clergy are are pretty. They don't want the grannies reaming out the bishop, you know. So they, you know, they, you, you turn off the microphone pretty fast when Yaya starts to, you know, let loose. So, whereas if one is a, a married clergy, there's someone close at hand to to let you know when you're messing up. They can not only support you when you and encourage you when you get discouraged. You can say, honey, don't give up. You're doing the right thing. Persevere, hang in there. And, and if you do mess up, they can say, honey, I love you, but that was stupid, you know? So um, there's, there's um, the, when you need to be pumped up, they can pump you up. When you need to be uh, corrected, they can, they can offer that as well. And, and most married people will know that the, one spouse is generally not shy of offering uh, needed, needed, needed correction. And that's exactly as it should be. Yeah, I agree with everything you have said. I, the only thing I would add is like, is that, you know, it on a general level, it's, you know, if you don't have the experience, direct experience of something, you, you, you probably don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. But on a higher level, if you actually are a saint, if you're Saint Paul, Yeah. Uh, you're not married or you know the ultimate example christ but you probably know a lot more in some sense because you can judge it from this spiritual uh, you, you have not you know the direct experience of having biological children right. but you you have this penetrating eye and can see what the you know you are pr you're a proud man that's the problem you know on that level yeah that's true yeah um, It's kind of the exception that proves the rule because most of us are not Christ and apostles. Exactly. Or, yeah. I mean, yeah. If you're if you're um, levitating off the ground when you play, pray and glowing with uncreated light, you probably have all sorts of in, <laughs> insight to give on marriage and child rearing, even apart from that. But in my experience, most parish clergy are not that, and so um, it, yeah. it, it therefore helps uh, in the absence of having scaled the heights of sanctity. It's a good thing to um, yeah have, have that extra help. Yeah, no, but I totally agree. I just mentioned it because, you know, as you mentioned, we have also the bishops that are not married and uh, yes. that doesn't mean they should not teach about family life. Obviously, that's... Uh, well, they, they usually, in my... And of course, some of them were married and widowed. So yeah, they yeah. do have... Uh, and that's and true. very often, they're, the teaching that, that comes across is is in the encyclicals about the importance of marriage and things like that. You know, yes. the, the stuff that John, John Chrysostom would say. Um, but in terms of marriage marriage counseling, you know, to, to go into the, the in individual situations of saying, you know, the wife and I are fighting all the time uh, and we're thinking maybe we should get marriage counseling or a divorce, you know, father, what do you think? You know, in that sort of kind of hands-on detailed stuff, um, the, it really helps to... Uh, have been there so yeah um, all of this means of course that um if i may put in a, a plug for all of the married um uh for all of the matushki and the um the clergy wives 
they are the unsung heroes of the church because as soon as you are ordained, you and all of your family have a target painted on your back. Uh, not if, 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 the, if the parishioners don't shoot you uh, or aim a few arrows at you, sometimes they aim and miss, um, the, the enemies will certainly aim the arrows at you. And so that means that a clerical family is under uh, a lot more pressure and, and vulnerability to spiritual attack and that includes the wife and the kids. Um, so the, um, the, the challenges at attending being a, being a priest's wife, I think are even more, uh, more momentous and weighty than the challenges attending the priest. I think it's, I would suggest that it's harder to be a priest's wife than it is to, than it, than it is to, be, a, uh, that is to be a priest. So they deserve all sorts of uh, praise and uh, for the work that they do, and and prayer to support them in that work. They are they are the unsung heroes. Yeah, so that's a good segue into the topic because I, I really think there should be more literature and uh, teaching about this. Is there a calling to become a pri uh, priest wife? And I ask this because I know. Uh, women that have said this that are married to priests that uh, it's it's almost a match you know that yeah. they or maybe if they didn't have it in the beginning because we have the situations where, where two people married they're in the church and then there is this gradual awareness of a priest calling yeah. and the wife said yes that's that's wh where I want to be too yeah I think you're right I I'm once again I, I'm reluctant to to use the phrase a, a calling because it sounds like more mystical, like you know, the, like Sorry. <laughs> the, the enunciation. But I take your I take your point, and I think yeah. that there is a um, there is a calling in the sense that um, not everybody can do that. There are some wonderful pious people that shouldn't be priests because they don't have the gifts of leadership, and there are some wonderful pious uh, Christian women who aren't cut out to be matishki or the uh, a presbytera. You know, you've got to it's. It's too, um, there are all sorts of pressures, you know, and, and critiques level at them. I, I, I happen to be in an absolutely wonderful parish, so I, I have no reason to complain, but I wasn't always in a wonderful parish. And so there are all sorts of attacks aimed at the priest in some places and at the priest's wife as well. Um, and not all women are, are up for that. So I think it's important that the, uh, the, the, the wife of a priest signs up for this to say, you know, I think you feel a calling to do this. You feel that you want this is something that you have to do that. Uh, I, I believe in you. I believe that God has called you to do it. And I'm enthusiastic about helping you to do this. You know, so she, she shares that work. She shares that calling. Um, it's, it can be difficult if the priest says, I feel this great call to be a priest. And the wife says, I oh, will. Okay. I don't want to do, I don't want to be a priest wife, but, Okay, I guess so. You know, that's not. That will probably not end well. There, are, there are even canons I think that speak about that. You know, the the wife needs to agree. Yeah, and she's and the agree. I would say agree isn't just a kind of a. Um, okay, you know, no, not <laughs> just a sigh of resignation, and you yeah. can you can see the despair rising like steam off of her. You know, no, you gotta. It has to be a sense of. Mm -hmm. She, she shares his enthusiasm for doing this, yeah. you know? And so, um, so there's, I mean, there's a sense in which all, all, all married priests work as part, as part of a team, you know, he's the, uh, he's the one up there, but she is, she is the wind beneath his wings, you know, he will, he will only succeed and come out of it more or less unscathed. Well, no priest comes out unscathed, but uh, with a, it, it's as little scathe as possible um, because of her love and support. You know, she she will make or break him. And so, the, if, if a priest, I would I would even say that if a priest has a, has a successful ministry, most of the credit belongs to her. I mean, Holy Spirit, yeah, yeah, yeah. But humanly speaking, most of the credit for any successful priest belongs to the the, the, the uh, his wife who loves and supports him. And manages to keep him approximately sane in, in, yeah. in all situations. And the, that I think that's also true in a marriage. In even if you're not a priest, uh, yeah. it's what 
what are the, some of the maybe characteristics a woman that wants to become a priest wife should uh, try to obtain and or and also when you answer that maybe how do a man also find because i know there are this problem at least in greece that there are many young men that want to become priests but there are almost no <laughs> Uh, right. women that wants right. they have this i don't know why that maybe they have this image and you know the children of the priest are builded in school and uh but yeah what's i i can't speak for greece of course yeah but i mean that um or any place other than canada i suppose come to that um but i think that the there has to be said there has to be an enthusiasm about serving jesus you know what i say to my young people is that don't marry anybody that doesn't love jesus more than they love you you know if 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 if, if they if they, they kind of like jesus they're kind of pious no, no 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 don't don't do that don't marry them unless their love for jesus exceeds their love for you you know so that's the whether you're going to be a priest or a plumber or whatever that's what you got to do so in the same way you have to, I, if someone says, I would like to be a priest, you have to find someone that when you share the, your aspiration and your desire to be a priest with her, she says, you know, I love you. I believe in you. I think you'd be a wonderful priest. I already love Jesus with all of my heart. I think that's how we can serve Jesus together. That's the reaction that you're looking for, you know? Um, and and they're, they're probably, and possibly few and far between, but her, her enthusiasm for being a priest's wife will be the fruit of her love for Jesus and of the love for you. If, 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 she's, if she says, I love Jesus more than I love you, and, 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 but, I, but I love you too, and I believe in you. I believe that God has called you to do this. Then she will have the enthusiasm to be a priest's wife. Um, like I said, I don't know. My, my guess is that there is less cultural expectation and baggage uh, for the Orthodox Church here in Canada in the, US, in, the, in the U.S. than there is in traditionally Orthodox lands like Greece and Russia, where it's, it's more of a, the priests and the presbytera, it's more of a, you know, everybody knows what that's like. Most people don't know, don't know what that's like. I mean, they, they don't know what a priest is here, much less, you know, I remember there was one, if I could share one silly story with you. Um, yes. I was at um, my... Um, my, one of my children was at a, um, a had a role in a dramatic thing. So we're, we were at the school watching the, this dramatic thing, and I was dressed like this, you know, complete with the cross. Um, so during the intermission, we're standing out there, and one of the one of the parents says to one of the other children, "Who's that guy there dressed as Dracula?" You know, because I was in black. And so, to our to our credit, the the the, the child said, "Oh, mom, that's that's Rhiannon's dad. He's he's a priest." Okay, but again, so keep so, so um, but most people don't know the, there's there is no handy cultural uh, slot to put the priest in. You know, I know I know the priest and the priest wife, and they have all these expectations. There's no you know priest Dracula, whatever. I mean, you're some weird guy wearing black. You know, so um, so that uh, that perhaps is a that um, cultural secularism. It, it, it's, it's, it's a mostly a pain, but it, it at least means that there aren't uh, the presuppositions. Everybody knows what a priest's wife is supposed to be. Most most people most because most people don't know what a priest is, much less a, a priest a priest's wife. Anyway, that's my guess. They were having been outside Canada ter terribly often. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it's it's like this here because you, on the one hand you have you're speaking about the orthodox country and so on and on the other hand there's priests are like despised by many people it's like and there is really no good reason but it's like uh, you know this uh, i don't know i don't i want i don't want to speculate so what yeah have many more how much time do we have more because probably about Probably about 10 minutes before the phone yeah. starts to ring. <laughs> so how should a priest then balance his life with his family, his wife, his children, and his parish life? Because 
I, I can imagine that there, it's not always so easy to do that. Where should the priority lie? Um, the, I think that the foundation for everything else is to say, um, my main priority is Jesus. Everything that I do, I do for him. So that means that prayer has to undergird everything. If your priest is not a, a man of prayer, you're, you're gonna, you're, you're, you'll be toast very quickly. This is, this is not gonna be good for you. Um, so wh whatever you do, whether it's, uh, whether it's church or whether it's family or whether it's citizen or whether it's whatever, you, you, you do it in the name of the Lord. You do it as a disciple of Jesus. Um, um, that's, that said, what I say to my young men is that the priorities are Jesus, obviously first, and, and then family and then parish. It, it is a bad mistake that will bite you badly if you if you if you confuse and, and, and if you fuse together um, uh, parish and Jesus to you know to say well Jesus is more important than you so I'm going to spend all my time with the parish and never have time for the family don't do that you you are God is, God may or may not want you to be a priest forever but you but you're going to be a husband and a dad forever so you got to so you need the, the family needs to know that the, the family comes before the parish. So that means that you got to build in time somehow. And if you're a, if you're a worker priest, it can be it can be difficult. A lot of the clergy, at least in North America, um, have a secular job because the parish is uh, small and just starting up, and they can't afford to pay a salary to the priest to, that he can live. So you got to work in a secular job too. So, but so that can be challenging to find the time, but you got to find the time. Your family has to know that, uh, that I am more important than the parishioners. You know, the, your kids, the kids have to know if it's a choice between a parish council and, and what the kids need from you, the kids come first. You got to yeah, that, be challenging, but that it has yeah. to be that way. Yeah. I, I have sort of heard the opposite. Uh, that you know there is this the mistake people do is that they forget their family uh, the biological family the children their wife yeah. and there needs to be also recognition also from the bishop that the priest is also this human that needs to eat and you know be at home yeah. but when we when you know when these two are met and in some sense, the first priority is the family of God. Yeah. Uh, and but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you neglect your right. wife and children um, because, yeah, it's <laughs> you're also this father. But would you say that the first priority is the church in some sense that no? No, no, absolutely not. Your first priority is Jesus. And it is out of your love for Jesus that you look after your wife and your children. It is out of your love for Jesus that you look after the church. But if the, if the, if the wife or the family feel that the, the parish is more important than, 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 than they are, this will be bad. I mean, I know I was doing a retreat in another town one time, and I was talking to uh, this guy who um, did, uh, um, from an, another parish, and he said, mm -hmm. "My dad, my dad was a priest, and I will never set foot in a Orthodox church ever again after the way that the parish that I that I grew up in, after the way that they treated my dad, I will never set foot in a Orthodox church ever again in my life." Okay then. So, but that's what happens when things. Well, what, what it, the, from what we're talking about before, when you have a toxic parishes like that, the, the, the parish probably should have been closed. But I mean, but that that the kids need to know that you are more important than the parish, because the parish doesn't. You say, "Oh, it means Christ in this church." No, it means a parish council. Okay, it means the ladies' group. It, it means all the various activities in the parish. So, concretely, that's what you, that's what you're choosing over your children. You know, parish council meeting or a meeting of the ladies' aid or the, the youth group or something like that. These are activities that the parish, that the parish does. You're, so you, there, there, has to be, there, have, there has to be a sense of boundaries. Obviously, you got to have a parish council meeting. But 
so it, it it's hard to it's hard to balance them but um the if, if the parish becomes more important than the needs of the biological family i mean it's hard in canada anyway it's hard enough growing up to be a priest kid anyway because you're you're orthodox in a very non-orthodox world having hot dog day and it's a friday at school and you're not you're not the only kid in your class not eating hot dogs because it's friday you know i mean it's hard enough to you know. now we have the vegans so it's like yeah, that's right. you're almost a liberal right? eating that's, meat that's on right. yeah, of, like you could all sorts of uh, <laughs> virtue signaling here yeah, yeah, i'm eating my vegan hot dog in that one it was that um but it, it's hard enough to be a priest wife and especially to be children of the clergy uh with, without adding any more burdens to them um there that's why a number of clergy kids you know is i mean there was one remember um kids got together with other clergy kids and they were sharing you know what's your most vivid memory growing up and they said waiting for dad to finish on sunday morning you know that they all thought that the first one there the last one to leave um and, and that that's okay they say well this is I, I'm happy to be in the parish. I love my dad. My dad's a priest. I'm gonna. I, I, I willingly make the sacrifice for dad because he's because he's because he's a priest. So, like the priest wife, the the priest children also share in some sort of a uh, call and and pressures and challenges. It's not the priest's job to add weight to that burden by giving them the impression that somehow the parish council meeting is more important than spending 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 time with you you got to do the parish council meeting but that means you 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 have to make time for them someplace else you know yeah obviously i agree with that it's yeah i was more thinking of some kind of substantial you know if if yeah i don't know how to explain it so maybe we can <laughs> talk about another time but i think we all have these different experiences we have seen this misuse in different ways so that forms also how we we you know we live in our context and we see a typical or we see a specific problem so we say no you can't do this for example in our society we often you know we focus so much on the children that we forget that my wife is actually the one i sh- i will live forever with and my children will move on so yeah, sure. so maybe we can say oh you sh-. so i say sometimes to people you know you you should uh, um you know pay more attention or love your wife more yeah. and it's like well what do you mean the children uh, you know <laughs> so, but no, yeah but I, and like the like as you as you point out after 18 years or so the kids are you know they're they're gone off to off to school or jobs or whatever we get married and they're gone um, um, but the, the nest might be empty, but the wife is still going to be there with you. So when I, if, if I had any advice to married people, which I'm required to have advice, I would say, always be kind and never stop courting your spouse. You know, you never, you, you do. don't be kind until you're married and then you can be your, just a normal slob self. No, you gotta, you always, um, if you always continue to be as kind and attentive to her after you're married as you were as you as you were before yeah. and that yeah. means that you got to figure out it's a, it's a matter of those boundaries to say okay i'm going to close the door for, for example and in, in our own house every every mm-hmm. sunday night was family night so i don't answer the phone i'll go I'll, I'll listen to the messages and if somebody in in the parish says father lawrence I'm, in, I'm at the emergency with my kid okay you stick on the cassock and you go there but if you're not bleeding, I, I, this is my time with my wife and children, you know, so, so that they, uh, again, you have to try, to try to somehow build in things to say, I, I'm going to give my wife what she needs. I'm going to or, or give my family, my children what they need. Um, so you have to carve out of the pie, you know, sometimes the parish wins and sometimes the family wins. But if the, yeah. if the, if the family never wins, that's, that's when troubles can begin yeah exactly we should not as you said we should not forget that loving christ is to love your family to take care of them and uh, as uh, dr Jeannie constantina said to me we i had an interview with her uh, some months ago and after the interview we talked a bit and she said you know don't forget to be romantic (laughs) with your wife (laughs) and yeah it's 
it's easy to forget that. You need to have candles, not just in church. Yeah, but I hate candles now because you have small children and it's like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. Everything is very... Yeah. Um, is, it, is there something else uh, you want to mention before uh, we close? Um, just that um, the, there's probably um, uh, nothing more wonderful that I can think of than the job of being a priest. Um, the, it had, and also nothing, nothing, nothing more challenging than that. So if, if for all of the people that aren't clergy out there that might listen to this, I would say, please love and pray for your priest. He is, he is suffering more than you think he is, almost certainly. Um, he is under more stress than you think he is. And he has a spiritual target painted on his back. Uh, and that, that, that is also painted on the back of his, backs of his, uh, of his wife and children as well. So whatever you do, don't let a day go by without praying for your priest. Because he, he really needs it. That was uh, very wise words. And uh, um, yeah, I think this was very helpful for me. And I think it will be very helpful for also uh, others that have listened to this interview. Um, Father Lawrence, thank you for your uh, kindness to accept my invitation. I, I feel really privileged to uh, talk to you. And uh, it, it's hard to do interviews. I'm always thinking, what, what's my role? Is it, you know, to ask questions so I'll be more engaging? And I, I, I want to find this balance, you know, not uh, ask these questions that other people have too. Right. And uh, also, you know, to have this engagement and uh, with respect and love. Yeah. Um, yeah. But thank you very much. This was very helpful. You're welcome. And as always, it is a great joy to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, I will uh, talk to you soon again. Bye.